Hello everyone and welcome to our today's class. It is our second class on the topic heat transfer. So let me begin by giving you the quote of the day which states that uh, the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is just the word extra. So what does that mean? That means that for you uh, to be extraordinary, you have to do the extra work. You have to do the extra. So we'll discuss that quote at the end of the class. So today we are looking at uh, thermal conductivity in liquids. Thermal conductivity in liquids. So to understand that, let us start by an experiment which involves to demonstrate that water is a poor conductor of heat. So in this experiment, the apparatus are arranged as shown in this experiment. In this diagram, the apparatus required is a, a glass with uh, some boiling water, a glass boiling tube, of course filled with some water. We'll also need uh, a source of heat, maybe a Bunsen burner, and we also need uh, ice which is wrapped in a wire gauze, an ice wrapped in a wire gauze. So the experiment is set up as shown in the diagram. Then uh, water is uh, heated at the uh, at the top, yeah. So water boils at the top of the uh, the glass tube. Uh, so it is observed that actually water is heated at the top of the glass tube. So it is observed that the water boils at the top of the uh, at the top of the glass tube, producing steam. While the ice, yeah, this ice which is wrapped in the wire gauze at the bottom of the uh, glass tube remains unmelted, remains unmelted. So water is heated at the top, uh, then an observation is made. So it is observed that when water is heated at the top, the ice inside the wrapped in the wire gauze does not melt. Now what does that show? That shows that water could not conduct heat from the top actually up to the bottom. So this ascertains or proves or confirms that indeed water is a poor conductor of heat. So you can be expected to describe a simple experiment showing that water is a poor conductor of heat. So here is the experiment. So water is boiled at the top. So water is boiling at the top but the heat does not reach the wire gills. That's why the ice does not melt. So this shows that water is indeed a very poor conductor of heat. Water is a poor conductor of heat. So in the same same experiment there are some things that are uh, a student should actually not within the same same experiment and the things that a student should notice that uh, the boiling tube is made of glass remember glass is a poor conductor of heat so this boiling tube remember it is a glass boiling tube so it is made of glass which is a poor conductor of heat uh, which limits uh, uh, a pos possible conduction of heat down the tube so we usually use a glass tube which is a poor conductor of heat so that it does not conduct heat from the top downwards. Yeah. Then a student should also note that the eyes, this eyes here, it is wrapped in a wire gauze to ensure that it does not float. So the purpose of the wire gauze in this experiment is actually to confine or to restrict the eyes at the bottom of this glass tube. Yeah, then a student should also note that uh, uh, the fact that wire gills is a good conductor of heat and yet the ice remains unmelted at the bottom shows that there is very little heat conduction in water which is unable to melt the ice. So that again confirms that water is a poor conductor of heat. Then water is heated at the top of the uh, our glass tube so that to eliminate the, possibi the possibility of heat conduction uh, to the ice by convection. So remember if we are heating it at the bottom actually heat could be conducted upwards through convectional currents or through convection. So those are three important uh, aspects that sh students should know. Uh, the purpose of the wire girls is to confine or restrict the ice at the bottom of the uh, our glass tube. Why we use a glass tube? Because it's a poor conductor of heat so that it does not conduct the heat from the top up to the bottom. Then why does we why do we heat the water at the top and not at the bottom? So that to prevent heat transfer to the wire gills by a uh, convectional current or through convection or through convection. Then we also have uh, another question here which students should know. Why 
uh, why are liquids poor conductors of heat why are most liquids poor conductors of heat so liquids remember when we were discussing about uh, particulate nature of matter we did say that in liquids the particles are slightly far apart so liquids are poor conductors of heat uh, because pure liquids have molecules which are further apart from each other due to the uh, so due to the large intermolecular distances between the liquid molecules so that prevents collision of the molecule of the liquid molecules hence no heat is transferred remember for there to be heat transfer one molecule should get to another molecule it should transfer heat from one molecule to another but in liquids we are saying that the particles are far apart therefore the intermolecular distances are larger therefore particles do not travel from one molecule to transfer heat to the next molecules so that's why liquids are poor conductors of heat so we are saying that pure liquids have molecules further apart from each other due to the large intermolecular distances between the liquid molecules so that prevents collision of liquid molecules hence no heat is transferred hence no heat is transferred so we can also look at uh, various uh, applications of good and poor conductors of heat so remember in life you need to know the application that is what is the importance of uh, uh, heat conduction how is it applicable in a real life situation so the first application actually of good and poor conductors of heat is in uh, what we call the cooking utensils so cooking utensils soldering irons and boilers are made of metals uh, uh, which conduct heat rapidly remember we said that metals are good conductors of heat so if you are making uh, cooking utensils you need materials that will conduct heat faster actually so that to boil the water or even food faster so for the cooking utensils the handles are made of uh, insulators such as wood or plastic yeah the handles for example if you look at uh, most spoons they will always have uh, either wooden handles or even in some cases uh, some plastics yeah why because the wooden handles are poor conductors of heat so that you are not burned when you are actually uh, cooking using those particular uh, utensils or spoons then metal pipes carrying water from boilers they are lugged with uh, cloth soaked in uh, plaster of paris uh, to prevent heat losses so the water from the boilers are lugged with the uh, cloth cloth soaked in plaster of paris remember the plaster of paris is a uh, an insulator which is actually a poor conductor of heat so that you don't get burned then another application of uh, good and poor conductor of heat is that in firefighters uh, firefighters put on suits uh, made of asbestos material yeah to keep safe while putting out fires remember we categorize asbestos as an insulator or a poor conductor of heat so in case there is fire you are a firefighter so when you get close to the fire you could actually be burnt so to prevent that they usually wear clothes or suits which we, with the uh, asbestos uh, which is a poor conductor of what heat uh, then also uh, the fourth the, the third application of uh, poor and uh, good conductor of heat is in, in blood uh, the, the birds uh, the birds flap their wings after getting wet as a means of introducing air pockets in their feathers now remember that air is a poor conductor of heat so air being a poor conductor of heat reduces heat loss from their bodies so that is how birds are able to maintain their body temperatures high so they flap uh, their wings after getting wet as a means of what so that to introduce an air pocket in their feather so th that air pocket is what prevented prevents heat loss from their body therefore they remain uh, warm then also in modern buildings where the desired inside temperature is to be stabilized or maintained we usually use double walls huh? so the double walls are constructed in such a way that air is trapped in between them now remember air is a poor conduct of heat so it means heat will not be lost actually from the room outside uh, that room then in the, the other application of uh, poor and good conduct of heat is in a uh, experiments uh, involving heating water or liquid in a glass beaker the beaker is usually placed on a wire gauze now remember a wire gauze ensures there is uniform distribution of heat so the gauze is heated and uh, 
spreads the heat to a large area of the beaker. So if a Bunsen burner or any other relevant source of heat is used to heat the beaker without the gauze, the wire gauze, the heat from the flame may concentrate on a smaller area and this can make the beaker to uh, crack or even break. So a wire gauze is used because it ensures uniform distribution of uh, heat, therefore preventing breaking of the glasses. So look at our uh, second last uh, subsection here which involves convection. Now what is conve convection? So convection refers to the process by which heat is transferred through fluids. Remember when we talk of fluids we mean either liquids or gases. So convection is the process by which heat is transferred through fluids. Then it convection actually involves uh, the actual movement of fluids by convectional currents. So this could be either natural or forced. So in, in short, those are the uh, types of what? Convection. So there are two types of convection. We have natural convection and we have forced convection. Now what is the difference between these two types of convection? So natural convection involves change in density of the fluid uh, with the temperature. That is when you heat a fluid, maybe a liquid or a gas, obviously it expands. When it expands, it means the volume has increased, therefore density reduces. So when the density reduces, it means such a, a fluid will actually uh, float on the surface, whereas the denser one, that is which the one that has not been heated, it moves downward. So that movement uh, is what we are calling the natural convection. So natural convection involves change in density of the fluid with temperature. The other type of convection is what we call the forced convection. So forced convection involves mixing of hot and cold parts of the fluid through some external stirring, like a fan or a pump. So to stir is actually to ensure, yeah, you can just maybe use a spoon or any other relevant instrument to stir so that you ensure there is uniform uh, distribution of what? Heat. So uh, to understand convection, we need an experiment here, which is to demonstrate convection in liquid. So we have an experiment here demonstrating convection in liquids. So the apparatus required here is uh, maybe a large beaker, which is uh, half filled with uh, water or even up to the top. We also need uh, potassium permanganate. Remember the purple, the color of uh, potassium permanganate uh, is usually color purple. It is usually color in, in purple in color. We, we may also need a source of heat, maybe a Bunsen burner. Uh, we may also need a stand. Uh, yeah, those are the apparatus actually required in this experiment. Now, how does the experiment take place? Now, when the potassium permanganate, so remember the source of heat is at the bottom. So we usually place the potassium permanganate at one end of the beaker. So when the potassium permanganate, these are the one here, when the potassium permanganate is heated, a purple coloration uh, rises up. That is this way. So when the potassium permanganate is heated, a purple color, a, a purple coloration rises. Uh, it rises up it rises up tracing tracing a circular path as shown this way so it traces a circular path from here it moves a circular this way coming to towards this direction so after some time the whole water actually becomes purple so because the potassium permanganate is moving in a circular path actually that uh, demonstrates existence of what convectional current so these are the arrows showing the convectional current. So this is an experiment to demonstrate existence of what we call the convectional currents. So lastly, we look at uh, another experiment also demonstrating convectional currents, although now this case in gases. So here, here is an experiment to demonstrate convectional uh, or convection current in gases. So in uh, this experiment, the apparatus required, one we need a box uh, with two chimneys and a transparent front. So this is our transparent uh, front. Then we also need a candle, of course, to heat the smoke. Then we also need a smoldering straw. So a, st a smoldering straw simply means it is burned on uh, one side such that it can produce us with uh, some smoke. Then we may also need a piece of cloth or even a piece of what? A piece of paper. 
So in a part of the procedure in this experiment, we light the candle beneath chimney B. Remember this is our chimney B. So we light the candle beneath chimney B as shown in this diagram. Then we place a smoldering straw at the mouth of the chimney. That is in the uh, uh, B and leave it for some time. So then we observe actually what happens. So it is observed in this experiment, it is observed that the smoke is observed living through the chimney B. Um, so the smoke is observed living through the chimney B. So the candle heats up air above it, uh, which becomes lighter and rises, uh, and rises uh, up. So cold heavier uh, air particles or cold air, uh, remember cold air is usually denser than uh, the warm air, actually is drawn uh, through and uh, through chimney A, uh -huh, carrying along the smoke, which replaces the lighter air uh, leaving through chimney chimney B. So in this experiment we just heat uh, a smoldering uh, straw on one end such that it produces us with the smoke. Then the smoke flows actually downwards. Uh, that is from chimney B. So the purpose of heating the straw is to obtain us the smoke. Now when the smoke gets in this cell it moves in such a in this manner However, when it reaches here, we have a candle here. Now, remember the candle will hit the smoke or the air above it. When the air above the candle is heated, remember when we heat air, it expands. When it expands, it means its density has reduced. And whenever the density has reduced, it means now that air is actually lighter. Therefore, it moves upwards. Now, the cold air outwards here, which is not heated, being denser, it actually moves through chimney A with the smoke pushing it what downwards to replace the air that has uh, uh, raised upward with the smoke here so in this experiment we just uh, hit uh, when the candle is hit the smoke at this point the air above the candle expands thereby uh, its density reduces hence it floats or it moves upwards so the denser air outside the smoke cell actually being denser it moves inward through chimney B, which is not, of course, heated. So as it moves downwards, it moves with the traces of what? Smoke. So the direction of movement of the smoke is seen to be moving in this manner, demonstrating existence of what? Convectional currents. So we've come to the end of our class today, but we need to discuss the quote of our day, which stated that... Uh, the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is simply the word extra. So that means that for you to achieve extraordinary things in life or for you to be extraordinary, you must do the extra work. You must do the extra work. So also remember this, that there are not great people who do great things in life, but common people do great things for them to be great. Yeah. When a common people does something great, Actually, the thing that they have done is what raises them to their greatness. So they are not great people who do great things, but common people do great things for them to be great. And lastly, also remember this, that impossibility is a myth. Yeah, there is nothing like impossible. If you break down the word impossible, it actually means, remember the first two letters are I and M, which is I am. Then the second letter is what? The possible. So if you break down impossible, you simply get am possible. So there is nothing like impossible. It is just a means I am possible. I am possible. This is Kind Tuition Academy. Hit that subscription button on YouTube. Thank you.